Next, let's talk about freshwater fish. So there's a lot to cover. You know, you could take a whole class on ornitho on uh, ichthyology. Sorry, I'm also going to talk about birds. You could also take a whole class on ornithology. Um, but here we're going to talk about fish. So lots of different morphological features of a fish. I'm just going to talk about some of the key ones that we use to tell fish apart. Um, so where is the mouth positioned? Is the mouth at the end? That's a terminal position. Is it pointing up? That would be a superior mouth. Or is it pointing down? That would be an inferior or subterminal mouth. There's lots of different um, freshwater fishes. This just shows you some of them all at the same scale. So from the largest sturgeon down to the smallest minnow, there's a lot of variation in fish size and function and roles. Um, in terms of fish of Washington, there are 67 species, 37 are native, and 30 are introduced, and they fall in lots of different orders. This is just an overall list, is way too much information to take down. I'm going to go through each of these um, groups, or at least I'm going to go through the main groups um, in a little bit more detail. So first are the lamprey. Uh, they're eel-like, they lack jaws, they lack bones, they're cartilaginous, and they are often parasitic as adults. The young, however, subsist on organic matter and invertebrates in the benthos of streams, and they use undulation to move their body. So in terms of locomotion, they're undulators. They don't, they have a, a few little fins and a tiny tail that help them with that, but they're not flapping fins. Then we have the sturgeons. Um, here's a white sturgeon. There's also a green sturgeon. They are also cartilaginous and what we consider primitive. They predate the dinosaurs. Um, there are fossils of sturgeon going back 300 million years. They have both electrosensory and chemosensory detectors around their mouths. And then you can see some barbs there that they use to detect um, their prey. And they can reach four meters in length. That's over 12 feet long. So these are giant, primitive, river living fish. Some of them um, live quite a long time. They don't mature until they're about 10 to 20 years old. And so um, reintroduction programs are challenging because they have to survive in the wild for a long time before they reach reproductive maturity. Then we have the salmonids. Things like trout and whitefish, they all have an adipose fin, which is used to identify them. Um, they are powerful swimmers. They are streamlined. They tend to eat benthic invertebrates and terrestrial insects that fall into streams. And the larger fish can be piscivorous, meaning that they can eat other fish. The most salmon are anadromous, um, while most trout and whitefish are not anadromous. Here you can see some of the salmon that we have uh, in Washington state. Uh, the Chinook are also called king salmon. Chum are also called dog salmon. Coho are called silvers. Pink salmon are sometimes called humpies. And landlocked sockeye are sometimes are called kokanee. And then steelhead are technically rainbow trout that have developed an anadromous nature. So they run to the sea. They're sea run rainbow trout. This is a really cool figure because it shows um, the location of the dams on the Elwha River and the predicted potential range for all of these salmon that can make it now up past the two dams and into the headwaters of the Elwha. So we're all really excited to kind of watch their progress as they make it back up into this watershed. Here we have two species of cutthroat trout, both a resident cutthroat, cutthroat and kind of like the, um, the steelhead that I was talking about, there's also a sea run cutthroat. And you can just see slight changes in there or differences in their morphologies. Then um, we can talk about the char. So we have both Dolly Varden and bull trout. And char, they look kind of like uh, trout, but they have some differences. So char, including the imported brook trout and lake trout, which are both invasive species and in a lot of streams and lakes in North America. It can be distinguished from trout by their very fine scales and they have reverse coloration. They have white spots on darker background where other trout, the native trout we have around here, have dark spots on a lighter background. And so um, 
here's just kind of an overview of the life, life cycle of a developing Chinook going from egg to alevin to fry to smolt um, and all those shifts through their life cycles. Some other native species we have in Washington are mud minnows. These are Olympic mud minnows. They are the only endemic freshwater fish in Washington. They're very small, but they're related to the pike, which I'll talk about next. They feed on benthic invertebrates, eggs, and fish larvae. They can also breathe oxygen, like gulp. They can gulp oxygen from the air when dissolved oxygen is low. And they're considered a sensitive species in Washington. And we have some minnows, um, the Northern Pike Minnow and the Columbia River Dace. These are the largest, it's the largest family of freshwater fish. A lot of the minnows can live a very long time and reach large sizes. So not all minnows are small. They can reach up to eight pounds and 24 inches long. And some of them are voracious predators in the Columbia River and the Snake River. And they eat salmon smolts as they're migrating out to sea. They often also do very well in reservoir habitats, which is another challenge to salmon. There is a, um, a pike minnow sport re reward program in Washington and Oregon, um, and I think parts of Idaho too. So you can catch pike minnows and earn money. Um, they're trying to get them out of some of our systems. And we have some different suckers. Um, they are strictly freshwater species and they're benthic. So they hunt invertebrates from the stream bed and they scrape algae off of rocks. They have a very blunt snout with a subterminal mouth and they have thick rubbery lips. And we have the killifish and the live bearers. So a mosquito fish, um, a killifish, they're small, brightly colored. They tend to have upturned mouths and eyes and they live near the surface, especially in slow moving rivers, marshes and estuaries. Here's a couple sticklebacks. They are related to the seahorse and they have no scales, a very torpedo shaped body and three to 16 isolated spines along their backs. And we have some sculpins. Um, most sculpins are marine, but a few are freshwater. They have a very broad head and a very large mouth. And they have one to four spines on their operculum, which is their gill covering. They have two rounded dorsal fins and very prominent eyes. And males tend to guard nests located in the benthos of streams. Real quickly, I'm gonna take you back to Lake Baikal, Siberia. There's just some really cool fish there. So Lake Baikal is um, located in Siberia. It's a very long lake, 395 miles long, and it drains an expansive watershed of over 141 million acres. It's the deepest lake in the world. It's, all, it's over a mile deep and it contains um, 5,832 cubic miles of water. That's 20% of the world's unfrozen fresh water. It began forming 25 to 30 million years ago. It's one of the oldest lakes on earth and it has extremely high levels of endemism, meaning that there are lots of species that live there and nowhere else. And it's home to some really crazy things. So I've talked a little bit about the golomyanka, which is this candlefish that's made almost entirely of lipids. And they actually can be burned like candles. There's also a freshwater seal called the nerpa, the fattest seal you'll ever see. There are 86 endemic flatworms, 98 endemic mollusks, over 300 endemic diatoms, almost 300 endemic amphipods and 31 endemic fish species. So here's the Golomyanka, it's called the fat fish. Its body is over 30% lipids, it has no scales. And when they wash up, these are deep water fish, when they wash up on shore, they actually melt in the sun. It's one of the most numerous fish in Lake Baikal, but it's rarely seen because of the depth that it lives at. It's very small and it can withstand great pressures and can migrate down to 4,000 feet below the surface with no air bladder. It's the only viviparous fish in the temperate zone. It means it gives birth to live young. And then here's the freshwater seal, the nerpa. It lives in Lake Baikal. It's very closely related to Arctic seals. It can migrate up rivers and it can go without air for up to 70 minutes as it dives down to 900 feet. 
And they love to feed on those golem yonko at night, especially, and that's probably why they're so chubby. Um, they are endemic to Baikal. They're the only freshwater seal in the world and only found in this amazing lake. And they can live over 50 years. The other thing that you can find in Siberia is called the Hucho Taimen or the river shark. That's a salmon, folks. It can get to be nine feet long and over 100 pounds. It's a top predator and in fact it's known to take rabbits and birds from shore. If you're a fly fisherman fishing for hucho taimen, you use a fly like the one that's on the left that looks like a mammal. It's both threatened in Russia and Mongolia and um, it's been kind of featured on this mega fishes program. This is um, Zeb Hogan, he's a fish biologist um, he went to school with a friend of mine and then started this program, Mega Fishes. Um, so there's a lot of threats to salmon. Um, a lot of people talk about the four H's, habitat, destruction, hydrology, things like dams, hatcheries, and harvest. But what we learned um, from our readings is that we have new evidence that the chemicals from tires as we drive our cars around it into stormwater and they seem to be causing some severe uh, problems for salmon. Okay, 